Welcome to the second part of Diagnosis in Endodontics. Today I will talk about the daily practice about extraoral and intraoral examinations and tests that will provide us with the information we need for our diagnosis. In the last part we heard a lot of using communication strategies, forms and other tools that will help to record the medical and dental history. With this information in mind, we now can start to begin with examinations and tests. And we always remember the chief complaint, because this is the main reason why the patient comes. The examination can be divided in several steps. The extraoral examination, the intraoral examination with clinical tests and the radiographic examination. In addition to this, a more detailed CBCT scan could be necessary in some cases if the two-dimensional X-ray does not give us uh, the information you need for your uh, diagnosis. And of course, you have to compare your findings with the medical and dental history of the patient and with the chief complaint. The examination starts when the patient enters the room. What do you see? How does the patient look like? You can easily detect an extra roll swelling or at least some facial asymmetry. The localization of that swelling gives you a first clue what kind of problem the patient has. It is, is it localized in the front or in the back portion of the face? Is it unilateral or bilateral followed by palpation whether the swelling is firm or fluctuant, diffuse or localized. Palpation of the cervical and submandibular lymph nodes gives you the information whether an infection is localized has, or has spread to a generalized process which can affect the whole body. Firm and tender lymph nodes in combination with elevated temperature is a sign for an advanced infection which might or might not be triggered by a diseased tooth. Also, you have to think on other non-dental diseases which causes a facial swelling which involvement of the lymph nodes. Visible extralar sinus tracts can be sign of a dental involvement. They will close after a sufficient treatment of the affected tooth, like we know it from intraoral fistula. Most likely, a scar will remain here. By the way, fistula is not the right term to describe this type of drainage, because it has a different definition. We better should use the term sinus tract. Often, a reasonable finding does not take place at the first glance. The patient perhaps reports other compliance beside the chief complaint. Headache or back problems are likely to a craniomandibular disease. Palpation of the masticatory muscles are helpful to get more information. Also, a big masseter muscle could be a sign of bruxism, which in turn could have led to the chief complaint. At least have a look, at, uh, have a look on the patient. What does he or she look like? The facial expression is always a sign of how severe the pain is. A typical and often mentioned example is the patient who comes in <coughs> sorry, with a bottle of cold water in his hands. The cold water relieves the pain for a moment. A clear sign of an apical periodontitis, maybe. In addition, a light swelling is visible. The only thing you have to do is to find the offending tooth. Is it that easy? We will see. Extra oral examination will give you important information. Do your findings match the chief complaint? And if not, why? Is there an additional problem which, which the patient is not aware of? Are there more findings which could have led to the chief complaint? And if yes, which is the most important. Next to have you think of is whether there is a correlation between your findings and the medical and dental history. 
an easy example. The chief complaint a swollen upper lip. While your examination you detect a swelling and reddening of the upper lip. The definition of the nasolabial fold is almost gone. The dental history tells you that there was a trauma years ago of one of the central incisors. But also the medical history tells you that the patient often suffers from recurrent lip herpes. Hmm, both could be a reason for the chief complaint. Further, examination is necessary. In some cases you will find differences between your findings and the report of the patient. For example, chief complaint hypersensitivity of the left premolars in upper and lower jaws. While your examination, you find severe tenderness of the musculus temporalis anterior and posterior on the left side, but only light tenderness on the right side. Your first idea might be that the patient suffers from any type of bruxism. But the patient denies any signs of bruxism and headache. He does not have any stress and so on. Hmm, so more examination is necessary. The intraoral examination might be give you more if, uh, information. And as always, don't be biased from your first impression. Extraoral swelling must not necessarily be from a dental origin in every case. Especially when a swelling is localized in a region which is unlike to a dental process. Think of the parotid glands or salvatory stones, for example. Here you can see an example of a swelling of the upper lip. The nasolabial fold is almost gone and the tip of the nose is pointing upwards. The patient suffers from a painful upper central incisor. The dental history tells about a root canal treatment years ago, but she reports that the dentist was not able to find any canal entrance. No information of a trauma was present, but she reports a light tenderness since a few weeks. The lymph nodes were not affected. Next step would be the intraoral examination and to make a radiograph. When you perform the intraoral examination, the first thing you will do is to have a closer look on the entire intraoral system. That gives you an idea about how the patient is concerned about his or her teeth. Scruffy teeth are a first hint of how much the patient cares about his teeth. Defective restorations or extended carious lesions are suspicious, especially when the chief complaint is localized in the same region. Secondly, your finger explores the vestibular and palatilar or lingual region in upper and lower jaw. Swellings, which can be firm or diffuse, are detectable in this way. Thirdly, you will have to do some clinical tests. As usual, all abnormalities like ulcerations or unclear textures, textures should be documented and referred when necessary. An intraoral swelling is either visible or it can be detected by palpation. Often it is accompanied with a tissue reddening. It has to be determined of which origin the swelling is, endodontic, periodontic, both or none of them. The localization of the swelling gives you a clue because in most cases it is from dental origin. A generalized swelling of the gum is more likely a periodontal disease, but a local one could be a sign of an endodontic problem. For example, an anterior palatal swelling could have its origin from a lateral incisor or the palatal root of a maxillary first premolar. When you see an intraoral sinus tract, it is, in most cases, a sign of an infection of the periapical tissue as a result of an endodontic problem. Such a sinus tract can be very helpful to determine the problematic tooth, which the help of a Gutta-Percha cone, which is inserted into the sinus tract, the cone will follow the sinus um, to its origin. In most cases, it cases it will point to the involved tooth or at least near of it, which 
can be seen in the radiograph later on. Also, such a drainage is use, usually not accompanied with pain. Uh, but the dental history perhaps will tell you another story. The tooth could have been painful some days or weeks before. To detect a possible mobility of the teeth, you can use your fingers, or better, the handles of an internal mirror or a forceps for an improved visibility. The mobility of a tooth is a sign of compromised periodontal attachment apparatus and can be caused by a bunch of reasons, starting with a localized or generalized periodontal disease up to a trauma, a habit or an endodontic infection. Knowledge of the dental history is crucial to interpret these findings correctly. The ad adjacent teeth have to be tested as well. Each mobility which is greater than plus one should be considered as abnormal, but in most cases the mobility disappears when the causing factors are eliminated. An important step in enteroral diagnosis is to check the pocket depth in each tooth. It should be performed on the mesial, distal, lingual or palatal and vestibular aspect with a calibrated periodontal probe. The findings have to be documented. A generalized increased pocket depth is typically a sign of a periodontal disease, especially if it is accompanied with bleeding or probing, also known as BOP. A localized single pocket with increased depth could have several reasons. A drainage of endodontic origin where a periapical infection drains through the gingival sulcus especially on non-vital teeth. A deep periodontal pocket without any correlation to an endodontic process. A pulp test can clarify this. If the tooth does respond to the pulp test, a periodontal disease is most probably. Also, you have to think of a vertical root fracture, where the pocket often extends quite deeply along the root surface. Mostly, they are not easy to detect as you can see in this case. No question that a root fracture is always a reason to remove the affected tooth. The most common reason for any kind of toothache are carious lesions, defective restorations or restorations which were performed quite recently. Lesions, even if they appear small in diameter, could extend grossly inside of the tooth. And quite often, they reach the pulp chamber. Recently made fillings or crowns are always suspicious when a tooth becomes symptomatic uh, a short time later. If many different findings are present, the determination of a diagnosis could start to be challenging. Let's have a short look on a video. What you can see here is an uh, upper premolar with um, silver mobility and you see the mobility test which is performed with the forceps. Uh, you can see the premolar is quite mobile and um, you will see in the next pictures it is also intrudable. So this tooth has to be rated as plus three. Um, the tooth was saved with an endodontic treatment and it's still in function. Um, the diagnosis also has to be made while you're probing the pocket depth with a calibrated probe, as you can see here in the buccal aspect around the tooth surface, also on the palatal side in little steps to detect any bone destruction. So there are normal findings.
distally and mesially. Okay. Good. Also, you should check the occlusion. If there are any abnormalities, you can see the patient bites on this tooth and when he bites on this tooth, the tooth um, is intruded. The side shift. And you can see some traces of bruxism here on the palatal cusp. That might be the reason why this tooth um, was diseased. You can see a sinus tract on uh, maxillary central incisor. You can palpate the swelling and in most cases you will express some fluid. And you can easily make your diagnosis with um, the introducing an um, Gutta-Pagia cone in the sinus tract to trace where um, the inflammation comes from. In this case, it was a fracture, a vertical root fracture of this central incisor. Here you can see another upper premolar and you can see the dental probe goes into the pocket very deeply, that's about 12 millimeters, and mesially and distally there are normal findings. This is most likely uh, a fracture or it could be of an endodontic uh, origin. Um, the radiograph didn't give us the information we needed, so we decided to do a little surgical um, cut and um, we wanted to have a look on the root surface and you can see there is a crack. The tooth had to be removed, of course. Let us have a look on the clinical tests we can perform. The pulp test is an indirect method for the determination of the pulp condition and gives you an information whether um, vital nerve cells are present. It gives no information of the vitality of the pulp because we cannot identify any blood flow inside of the pulp visit. Also, the findings with the pulp tests don't have a good correlation to the histology. So a tooth may respond or not respond on the pulp test, although it is still vital. Especially on older patients, this is a common problem because of calcifications. A normal response is an immediately disappearing of the resultic sensation when the stimulus is removed. The most common pulp test is the thermal test. It can be performed as cold test or as a heat test. The cold test is performed with frozen carbon dioxide. It is a reliable method to test for vital pulp tissue in the tooth. But you should always have in mind the limitation of this test. For example, you perform a cold test on a multi-rooted upper first molar. You get a positive result. But you also can feel a light swelling on the vestibular aspect. It is possible that the nerve tissue is vital in the palatal root 
while the tissue in the buccal roots are already necrotic. To do the test, I use a cotton pellet with a carbon dioxide spray. The contralateral and adjacent teeth should be tested before. Then, when you have a baseline, you can test the affected tooth. Maybe you have to repeat the test several times to get a reliable response. Isolating adjacent teeth with rubber dam or plastic stripes are useful to prevent a false testing result when metal crowns and extended amalgam fillings are present. The heat test can be performed when the patient reports pain on hot liquid or hot food, is, but is not able to identify it. Several methods are possible. One of them is to use hot gutta percha mounted on a heat plugger. The heat plugger is activated for a short period. The gutta percha will melt a little bit. It is then applied to every tooth until the offending tooth is identified. Isolating the teeth with rubber dam is useful when using warm or heated water for heat testing. With a syringe, the water is delivered onto the isolated tooth to observe a normal or abnormal response. The electric pulp test has almost similar capabilities to determine vital pulp tissue as the cold test. But it has several limitations, as the electrode has to be in contact with natural tooth structure. In addition, the tooth has to be absolutely dry, which can be achieved by isolating it with rubber dam. But with both tests, cold and electric, we are only able to determine viable nerve fibers, which is only an indirect clue that this tooth could be vital. If it doesn't say something about blood supply, which, if present, classifies a tooth as vital. To make a long story short, the accuracy for the cold test is 86%, for the electric pulp test 81%, and for the heat test 71%, according to a study of Peterson in 1999. So the cold test, which is the most common test in dental offices, is a very reliable test to identify vital pulp cells. None of these tests is able to assess vitality um, on a tooth. But with a cold test, it is possible to detect the health status of the pulp, depending on the response it will give us. Especially when a patient reports pain on chewing or that the tooth has too much occlusal contact, the percussion test can verify it by tapping with the fingertip or the handles of a mirror onto this tooth. Trauma, bruxism, periodontal diseases, a periapical process of endodontic origin or other reasons can be cause of it. Similar to the pulp test, you should start with the teeth on the contralateral side and with adjacent teeth to have a normal response. The percussion test can be positive even when you can see any signs of inflammation on the radiograph. Sometimes, when you perform the percussion test, pain or discomfort can only be reproduced on a single cusp. The bite test can help to identify it. While a periradicular process will be reproducible painful when tapping everywhere on the tooth, a cracked tooth or a fractured, uh, a fractured cusp will lead to a response only in a specific area. To test a single cusp, for example, the practitioner needs a tool that will apply pressure only to a single area. Commercial available devices for the bite test are the tooth sleuth and the frag finder that you can see on the pictures. On older patients, a pulp test might be unsuccessful, especially then when not any tooth responds to the cold test. In most cases, calcified pulp chambers and canals are the reason why. Also, with full ceramic restorations, an electric test or a cold test will often fail. A small class 1 cavity preparation will be made through the crown or the tooth. The patient will not have any anesthesia, um, and when the bull reaches the dentine and the patient will feel pain now, it is a sign there is vital pulp tissue. But 
it does not indicate a vital tooth, similar to the pulp test. If there is no response, even deep in the dentine, it is an indication for a necrotic pulp. Um, this test is rarely performed, um, but it is useful when other tests have failed or were inconclusive. A challenging situation appears when a patient is not able to specify where the pain comes from. Selective anesthesia then can be done by performing intraligamentary injections. The practitioner will start with the maxillary most posterior tooth and continues to anterior until the pain relieves. If this is unsuccessful, he will repeat the same in the lower jaw. A very powerful tool for diagnosis is the dental radiography. Carious lesions, defective restorations, an um, apical inflammatory process and much more are detectable with the help of it. It gives us plenty of information and it is tempting to make a definitive diagnosis without any further tests or examinations. But this could lead to misinterpretations when the findings are not combined with the findings of other tests and examinations. An impressive example I have seen at a lecture from Professor Dr. Van Arx, who is an oral surgeon um, in Bern, Switzerland. I will show you to make this clear. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you the original pictures because of copyright reasons. Imagine you see an apical radiolucency on an upper central incisor. Um, a root filling is present, but the patient has no pain, and it is, let's say, an incidental finding. Percussion test is negative. There is no swelling and the pocket depth is within normal limits. But you see that radiolucency around the apex. And it could be an indication for an endodontic treatment. To make it short, that what appeared as an apical radiolucency was the projection of the foramen incisivum above the apex of the gentle incisor. Professor von Arx made clear on his lecture that a second X-ray with a different angulation was then helpful to discover the truth. The gentle incisor had not any radiolucency and thus there was no indication for any endodontic treatment. To get appropriate pictures, it is necessary to use special film holders which are available in different sizes and specifications. With them you can get standardized images where the angulation is always equal. This is, for example, useful to evaluate the healing process after an endodontic treatment on recalls. You also can avoid unnecessary additional radiographs and thus you can limit the radiation expo exposure for your patients. As mentioned above, Sometimes it is necessary to make pictures in different angulations. Let me show you a case to clarify this. A lower first molar where three canals are poorly filled. The patient had severe pain with the help of the dental history and the findings that were given by intraoral examinations and tests. This tooth could be identified as the offending one. At first glance you can detect two roots, one distally and one mesally. But when you look closer, you can suspect an additional root distally. With this information it was easy to find an additional distolingual root canal entrance with necrotic tissue in it. With a more measly angulated master point x-ray you can see all the four canals. The final root filling from autoradial. In this picture you can only see three canals, but we know four are present in reality. Another example. Two upper premolars, where you can detect a radiolucency in between them. The dental history reported a recently made filling on the second premolar. Percussion test was positive and it didn't respond on the pulp test. The first premolar responded normal on the pulp test and the percussion test was negative. Same with the molar. So it came out that the second premolar was the offending tooth. 
But why did the radiolucency appear on the mesial aspect of the root and not around the root tip? And have a look on the anatomy of the first premolar. What do you see? The answer was given by the next radiograph, which was angulated a little bit mesially. The second premolar had three roots and the radiolucency was caused um, either by a lateral canal of the palatal root or the shorter mesiobuccal root. The pulp tissue was totally necrotic. The three root canal fillings could only be shown with the two images and different angulations. Here you can see the palatal and the distobuccal roots. And here you see the palatal and the mesiobuccal root fillings. As I mentioned before, if an intraoral sinus tract is present, it is possible to follow to its origin. Uh, with a good aperture cone, which is inserted into the visible entrance until some resistance, you can make a radiograph. In this case, the cone points to the mesial root of this lower first molar. But also you can see that the distal root is much shorter in length. But the dental history tells nothing about a former surgical treatment. So it could be interpreted as a, peri a periapical resorption process due to the actual or previous inflammation. An open apex is most likely. So the diagnostic radiograph shows us not only where the origin of the uh, inflammation is located, but also gives us an idea what kind of treatment we can expect. As you can see, an open apex was present in the distal root canal as expected. To prevent an overfilling of MTA into the periapical tissue, some resorbable collagen was placed. This is not absolutely necessary because a small amount of overpressed MTA is not problematic at all. The apical part was then filled with MTA in good aperture, uh, as you can see on the final X-ray. And one last example to show you that a sharp eye on a diagnostic radiograph can be crucial for the following treatment. The first lower premolar with an apical radiolucency was sometimes painful. Now it was sensitive on pressure and the patient was not able to chew on this side. If you look closely, you can see that the main canal splits in two parts in the middle of the root. The final radiograph shows the lingual and buccal aspect and also a quite interesting anatomy. I hope you found it helpful for your daily practice. I'm sure that many of the things I talked about you have already known. But, and you hopefully agree uh, with me, it is always he helpful to recapitulate the basics. With this in mind, I say thank you for your attention. And if you have further questions, please don't hesitate and leave a comment. Or you also can write an email, of course. Uh, I hope we see you soon on uh, dentinaltubules.com. Thank you for your attention and bye-bye.